in life. Have you ever been walking down the street or been somewhere and suddenly been distracted by something that goes past you? Well, as demonstrated in The Matrix, this can be very dangerous. But as demonstrated in real life, it can actually sometimes be a lot of fun, especially when this involves toys. Welcome back to the Spectra Creative Channel, and we're talking about distracting toys today. And one of the most cool parts about distracting toys is when they have what's called vac metal or vacuum metal applied to them. This has been something that we've had in toys for about 40 years, and it could basically be summed up by the fact that it's a toy that is... Shiny. Well, shiny. And that's not paint you're seeing on those toys. No, when you have a toy that is shiny because of vac metal, it's not painted on. There's a very particular process of putting this onto a toy that's been created by some of the coolest scientists in the world and throughout history. And that's what we're going to dive into today, talking about the history of vac metal, how it's put on toys, and why it's put on toys. Now, scientists have been busy with a lot of things, like the singing fish, or finding a way to build a better ladder to the moon. And while they haven't been successful in all of these endeavors, figuring out a way to get toys to be shinier and more distracting to kids has been a top priority. And again, it's not something that's done as simply as painting the toy using acrylic paints by hand, which is how 90% of toys are done. It's actually done through a scientific process of using gas and lasers. Well, to understand this and how cool it is, let's dive in and do a little history. So, to start off, we have to go all the way back to 1640 with Otto van Gurek. He used a pump to remove water out of mines. And this pump system is actually what vac metalized process is based on. If it wasn't for the uh, pump mechanism that he created in the 1840s, we probably wouldn't have shiny toys today and kids would be way less distracted. Next up, we can probably skip ahead to 1838, where Michael Faraday, shown here holding a scale model of a snicker bar, used brass electrodes and a vacuum to create electric energy and to be able to essentially create a version of what we would think of as a modern laser. It wasn't a laser like Dr. Evil used, but at least it lit up. Next, we can jump ahead to W.R. Grove, who in 1852 was the first to study what became known as the process of sputtering. So sputtering is the technical term, or rather the industry term, for what vac metalization does. And although others had observed this effect, he was the first to see it using the tip of a wire as the coating source and using sputtering to create a deposit onto a highly uh, polished silver surface, which he held close to the wire at a high pressure point. This is a little technical, but essentially it was the first time an object was coated with a metal surface based on using a pump and gas system. So sputtering has had a lot of advancements over time, and we can probably jump ahead to 1858 with Professor A.W. Wright of Yale University, who published a paper in the American Journal of Science and Arts on the use of electric deposition apparatuses, which he used to create mirror surfaces. Now, Thomas Edison was not happy about this because it, it sort of infringed on something he was doing at the time, but when the case went to court, well, they found in favor of A.W. Wright, and essentially Thomas Edison got served and was told to basically pack it and head home. Next, we can fast forward to 1977, where absolutely nothing in pop culture happened. But, as far as the process of vac metalization, well, this is really when it became a actual modern manufacturing dynamic. And it was essentially the Thornton diagram shown here, which surprisingly was invented by a man named Thornton, which demonstrated how using a vacuum pump system could apply a metal-coated surface onto objects. All right. I know that was a little technical, and I'm going to try to actually drill it down a bit. So forgive, please. Let's actually jump in and talk about toys and look at the way they are actually covered with 
a metal surface. So Vec Metal, and one of the best historic examples, is the original Kenner C-3PO figure, which you can see here. Uh, he is probably one of the, the most famous back metalized figures because he still holds up. There was no flaking, there was no problems with him, he was great. And there were a lot of other figures in the 80s that used this as well. One thing that all of these figures had in common was they basically had limited articulation. They didn't have ball joints, uh, they just had sort of up and down movement of the arms or the head. So it made back metalizing easier because of not just the process, but the type of material used. As you add more and more articulation to a figure and have to use softer plastics to account for this type of articulation, it makes it more difficult to apply the vac metal uh, plating, or you know, uh, the, the metal, well, the, <laughs> it, it's a vacuum system, I'll explain in a moment. But essentially, the more a figure is like a statue or limited articulation, the easier it is to apply this. The more articulation, the more layers, armor, you know, different things like that, it makes it more difficult. So when I was at Jack Specific and we did a C-3PO for San Diego Comic-Con that only had basic articulation, like the vintage Kenner figure, it was pretty easy to do vac metal and make him look really cool in this episode 7 version that was sold at San Diego Comic-Con and later at Entertainment Earth, albeit he had the red arm, which we're all trying to forget about. So this is actually the mathematical formula for vac metalizing. I know, I'm not a scientist and I don't work in math, but here is the machine. So this is a vac metal machine. And what it does essentially is the machine evaporates metals, usually aluminum, inside a vacuum chamber, which is what you're looking at here. This is the vacuum chamber going up there on the right side. And these evaporating metals will then bond to the desired, what's called a, a substate, which is placed inside this chamber here. So that would be the said action figure without paint on it. And by putting the figure here as the evaporated metals descend, they basically, you, you achieve a uniform metallized layer over the action figure or tool or whatever it is. I mean, you can vac metalize anything. <laughs> you could back metalize a Twinkie. See, Marge, I told you. And uh, it's basically called physical vapor uh, disposition or thermal evaporation by uh, you know people with much bigger degrees than I have. My degree is in film studies and communication, not nuclear physics. So I'm definitely not a Sheldon Cooper when it comes to this. But I do have a basic understanding that's been uh, reviewed to me, I guess, by the designers I worked with on vac metal figures, and it's basically, yeah, it's, it's evaporating metal. And then as the metal sinks down, uh, going through this shutter and this cylinder shield, it hits the source and adheres to the figure, which is what causes it to look shiny and have a uniform surface, as if you painted it with metal. Um, but it's, it's not paint, it's evaporation. One of the problems with this is uh, vac metal or electroplated metal coatings tend to flake, especially when you use softer materials. So, for example, ABS and PVC are two of the plastic materials. ABS is very firm, PVC is a little bendy, like, uh, like Smurfs back in the 80s were made of PVC, little slug figures. ABS is what C-3PO was made out of, or the vintage Hurricane Hordak. And with the classics Hurricane Hordak, Unlike vintage C-3PO, who had very limited articulation, he only moved at the legs, arms, and head, which were basically on spinning joints. They were not on ball joints and you know, just clicked right into the open shell of the chest if you ever cracked one open, which eh, I don't really suggest that. You'll break your toy. So but while that metalization has been used on toys for the last 40 years... In modern toys, we don't see this as much, and it's essentially because of articulation. You can't vac metalize articulated parts. You can only do this with a part like an arm that has no further sort of elbow or wrist articulation because, well, the vac metalization will chip off. And while a lot of fans push back and want modern recreations like this Death Star droid to still have that shiny, shiny surface, it's just not possible. You can either have shiny surface or articulation. You can't have both. The technology just isn't here yet. And vac metal is still something fans continue to ask for, especially when it's an homage to a vintage toy. 
When Super 7 put out their hero figure in the Masters of the Universe line, originally he wasn't going to have that medal. But the fans spoke up, they rebelled, they threw lots and lots of tomatoes and bricks, and, well, Super 7 listened. And the final version of Hero had a vac metal armor on his chest, just like the original proposed toy in 1987 was supposed to. So, no articulation on the chest, easy to do vac metal. It's basically as simple as that. So, while vac metal has been something that's distracted kids and collectors for years, it still basically comes down to whether or not the toy is going to have articulation or not. If it doesn't, vac metal away. I hope you enjoyed this video, and it was an insightful look into the history, process, and things that can and cannot be vac metalized. And definitely don't try to vac metalize your cat. Believe me from experience, it's not a good idea. Share this video, like this video, see you on the comment section.